Hi, my name is Naomi Albertson. I'm a sports medicine and family medicine doctor at the Reno Orthopedic Clinic, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the aging athlete. So the objectives for today's talk are to define aging and anti-aging, to understand aging and the changes that occur to muscles, bones, and joints. And then finally, I'm going to summarize some of the recommendations um, that are currently supported by research to improve performance and minimize the effects of aging. I do have two disclaimers. One is that I am a uh, physician at the Renal Orthopedic Clinic, and I currently do take care of patients with these musculoskeletal conditions. And the second is that I am the owner and developer of a company called Dr. Nye's OC2. Uh, this is a supplement that's used by active adults who want to stay active. OC2 is a combination of vitamin D3, calcium citrate, magnesium, and creatine monohydrate for total frame support. So what is aging? The traditional medical definition is that aging is a process with inevitable complications such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, and the general steady decline of quality of life. This is not my favorite definition. Another definition, which I'd really like us to focus on more today, is the ability to accommodate to natural biologic and physiologic changes in ways that maximize quality living. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that we have an aging population. We have more and more companies that are devoting themselves to the process of aging. And we have many medications and supplements in development to address the concerns and medical complications of aging. Additionally, aging has become one of the largest topics um, supported by research, um, and we have spent huge amounts of money on this issue. And in fact, we have now developed a new branch of medicine dedicated entirely to anti-aging. This is a branch that is not yet recognized uh, by the ABMS. Uh, however, the um, involvement continues to increase. So what I'd like to do first is just give a brief history of what the understanding of aging is, and then to highlight some of the uh, interesting findings that have been made over the last several decades. So. Initially, in 1952, Dr. Hartman described free radicals in the human body, and he theorized that there was a link of these free radicals to aging. It took many years, but by 1972, scientists actually discovered that free radicals do exist, and they are created by normal cellular processes, and unfortunately are associated with damage to cells. So the theory then started that if we could decrease free radical production, that we could somehow slow or stop aging. And since 1972, that is primarily where the focus of supplements and medications has been focused. The antioxidants that have been shown to be useful are vitamin C, the carotenoids, melatonin, and omega-3 fatty acids, as well as turmeric. Additionally, we have now learned that there are genes responsible for activating reversal processes. That means that free radical production is controlled by a gene. That gene is called the SIRT1 gene. And if the SIRT1 gene is turned on, many aging symptoms Alzheimer's symptoms, diabetes, and some types of cancers are stopped. So, of course, we want to know what turns on the SIRT1 gene. And until 2003, the only known activator of the SIRT1 gene was calorie restriction. But after 2003, a product called resveratrol was identified. Resveratrol is a plant flavonoid that was discovered by French scientists when they were investigating why 
the high fat French diet was not associated with cardiovascular disease. They were able to find this plant flavonoid and realize that it activated the SIRT1 gene and actually stopped nearly all cell death and reversed the cardiovascular injury caused by free radicals. In 2006, further research showed that in mice who were given high fat diets, they had a 30% decrease in death when they were given resveratrol. Additionally, those mice were found to have doubled their endurance. Resveratrol also kept overfed mice from gaining weight, and when the mice were killed and their organs were looked at, their organs were pristine. They were not remodeled with more fatty tissue. So, of course, we all want to know where do we get some resveratrol. We would need quite a bit of resveratrol, as you can see here, in order to have the same effect that the mice experienced in the French studies. Consumers are interested in buying resveratrol. It certainly has science to back its benefit. Um, that being said, in 2007, Consumer Labs tested 13 different companies that were producing over-the-counter resveratrol and found that some of the supplements actually had no active ingredient at all in them. And that the cost of these supplements varied from a dollar to $75 per gram and was really not associated with how much active ingredient was present. I guess the good news is that in 2006, Dr. Sinclair and his group of Harvard genetics PhDs and researchers um, published a study that showed that resveratrol really truly could extend the lifespan of mice. And he started a company called Sertris Pharmaceuticals. That company was then purchased by GSK in 2013. Um, they shut down further uh, evaluation of resveratrol primarily to focus on more promising activators of the SIRT1 gene called sirtuins. So there are several uh, different chemicals in clinical trials, but unfortunately, as of 2017, we do not yet have a drug that can prolong our life or uh, improve our cardiovascular uh, endpoints despite high-fat diets. So we're going to go on now and talk about aging and muscles. So many of you already are familiar with this curve because you've been experiencing it. Uh, the curve shows that as we age, our muscle strength declines, and that's actually a natural process. That process is something called sarcopenia. And after about the age of 50, most adults are losing about 1.5% of lean body mass or muscle annually. After 60, that rate of loss accelerates to about 3% per year. Unfortunately, also, the loss of muscle mass is not uniform. The loss from the legs is usually greater than from the arms, and women tend to lose more than men. Also, the types of muscle fibers that we lose are not equal. Uh, fast twitch fibers are more affected by age than slow twitch fibers. Older muscle is also easier to fatigue, and recovery is slower and frequently incomplete. Well, none of this really sounds very good. So, you know, how do we put this all together as we age? We have less muscle mass and we're weaker. It seems to be worse in the legs than in the upper extremities. Our muscles are slower, and the recovery time, if complete, is longer. So the question really becomes, should we all become upper body focused endurance or slow athletes as we age? Or can we reverse these losses? So we're gonna talk a little bit about aging and performance and what we see. Well, I think for the senior Olympians out there, this is a really important thing to keep an eye on is that you can't really let age be a deterrent toward the amazing muscle gains that you can see even as you age. And we all know that, that if we start doing some exercise programs and we really focus on what we're eating in order to gain muscle, 
that we can truly still see gains even as we age. So although we can gain muscle, we really can't gain muscle to the point uh, of the top elite athletes um, who are much younger. And I'm just going to make that point by showing you here that the world record currently for men was set by Dennis Cometo, September 28, 2014, at the Berlin Marathon. And his time was 2 hours, 2 minutes, and 57 seconds. When you compare Dennis's time to the 2016 results from the Senior Olympic Games for men's 50, 55, 60, etc., you can see that those times are almost doubled by some of the very top performing senior athletes. So I feel like I've sort of painted a picture here of doom and gloom for those of us who are trying to stay active as we age and certainly for trying to set any records. We probably won't be setting any world records at age 50, but there is an upside here. And the upside is that chronologic age versus fitness age are very different. For those older athletes who have maintained fitness, it actually correlates with a chronologic age that is much younger, meaning that your lifespan probabilities, your, again, quality of life is likely improved. And I've just left here a website for a fitness calculator. If you'd like to go to that and put in your information, you can actually calculate your fitness age. The other thing I want to point out is that many senior Olympians didn't start athletics until middle age. And so, again, here we are talking about muscle decline as a normal part of aging. But I think it's important to point out that many of these athletes had already started to decline when they were able to get stronger and improve their fitness. So we're going to move on from muscle, and we're going to talk about aging and bone. So over here on the right, there's a nice little graph that shows that with age, which is on the bottom here, our bone mass uh, changes. And as an infant, which is uh, time zero here, you can see that your bone is going to increase, assuming that you are taking in vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, and getting some regular weight-bearing exercise. You are going to reach a peak bone mass somewhere around age 30 to 35. And that's going to be fairly stable until, for women, menopause occurs, and for men about 10 years later, so somewhere in the 60s and 70s, and we all start to decline. Now, the rate of loss for women is steeper or uh, more pronounced than for their male counterparts, and again, it seems to occur slightly earlier than men. And that decline continues until uh, late into the 70s and 80s, but you can see here at the end of the curve that that rate of loss after menopause for women does seem to taper off. On the left side of the screen here, I just want to take a quick look at these pictures. The one on the left is normal bone, and you can see those nice thick cross bridges. Kind of looks like Swiss cheese, but nice thick Swiss cheese. And on the right side, those cross bridges are much thinner. There's more black space. And that is what we call brittle bones or osteoporosis. Well, as many of you know, it's not really the diagnosis that's so exciting. It's really that what we're, the reason to diagnose is to try to prevent this 1.5 million annual fractures that occur in the United States alone. Um, vertebral fractures are particularly unnerving because two-thirds of those fractures go undiagnosed, primarily because the amount of discomfort that they cause may not be severe. Um, and often those fractures are seen only because of height loss or uh, spine curvature changes. You can see here 300,000 plus hip fractures annually. And hip fractures, as many of you know, are quite associated with increased morbidity and uh, mortality or death rate. Wrist fractures, I don't know if anybody has ever experienced a wrist fracture, but they're not very fun and really limit your ability to care for yourself. 
So again, highly associated with morbidity. Well, we just saw the curve of how we're all going to lose bone. And so I think discussing for a brief minute here at least, how do we avoid bone loss or kind of minimize that loss and fragility of our bones as well is really important. I tend to be focused on non-pharmacologic um, reasons because although I certainly do use and prescribe medications, I think that they need to be used specifically for people who are at risk. Um, Non-pharmacologic ways to prevent bone loss are use regular use of calcium, vitamin D3 in particular, mag and magnesium, um, getting regular weight-bearing exercise as both a stimulation to those bones for normal bone turnover, but also to maintain that muscle mass as best we can and to minimize our risk of falling. Um, having a fall risk evaluation uh, and a home exercise plan to minimize falls, again, it's incredibly important. Uh, limiting any medications that may have side effects that are associated with bone loss, specifically steroids um, and Dilantin. Um, and then stopping smoking, minimizing alcohol consumption. I think those are really critical, and we unfortunately are not doing a very good job in the medical um, world uh, with helping people achieve those uh, improvements. And then, you know, I write here sort of facetiously, but don't fall down. I mean, I can't say enough about that. I think certainly vertebral fractures can occur without falling uh, and actually just uh, sitting or, you know, uh, moving. But most of the other osteoporotic fractures that occur, occur because of falls. And then on this other side, there are many medications listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through those today. So let's just talk for just a minute about aging and joints, because I think here we have talked about muscles and bones, but I really don't think our discussion would be complete without talking about what happens to joints over time. So on the left side of the screen, you can see this nice, beautiful, healthy joint. Now, the glisteny part of this um, model in purple is not really purple in your body. It's actually white, and many of you have seen this type of cartilage on chicken bones, um, it's that glistening, shiny white cartilage. Unfortunately, as we age and we load these joints at times with too much excessive weight and maybe not enough muscle strength to support those joints, or if we've had trauma that has um, sped up the degeneration of these joints, we start to see areas of erosion um, and there's then exposed bone and bone, as I tell many of my patients, is pretty dumb, and all it knows how to do in response to stress is grow more bone. So it does that. We can develop bone spurs around the joint. And then, of course, if you line up these abnormal or irregularly contoured surfaces with a nice, soft, squishy pad that sits in many of our joints, this is a knee joint here, um, that you can actually cause uh, tears of those meniscal Pads. So how do we prevent degenerative arthritis? Well, I think that the um, mainstay of treatment is to maintain a lean body and minimize injury as best you can, and then really maximizing the kinetics of how that joint functions by keeping your muscles strong and nice and flexible. In medicine, you know, our treatment options for the treatment of these degenerative joints is to lose weight, again, unloading those irregular joint surfaces, to try to increase the range of motion and the strength of the supported muscles around those joints, minimizing load on the joint, using anti-inflammatories or pain relievers as needed, and then ultimately using surgery um, or joint replacement. So in conclusion, I want to talk about, you know, what can we do? Here we've just been talking about these natural physiologic changes that are going to occur as we age. And so i just like to highlight some of the few things that we can do to try to minimize those changes and maximize, again, the quality of our lives. I think the most important thing is that we're going to eat and drink 
to bring nutrients to our exercising muscles. I can't say enough about hydrating and about eating a varied diet um, and eating a diet that is high in protein, um, again, as we age. Staying healthy, so getting those vaccinations, um, again, eating a good diet, uh, maintaining you know, excellent mental health. I think those are all incredibly important. Training our muscles for what we expect them to do and then letting them recover. I can't tell you how many patients I see who tell me, hey doc, I'm gonna do this marathon, it's in a month. And I say, wow, have you been training? And they say, yeah, well, I started an online training course and uh, I just started training about two weeks ago and you know, my mileage is increasing and hey, my knee's starting to hurt and that's why I'm here, it's my knee and my hip, right? So I think, you know, being reasonable about training your muscles, giving your muscles adequate time for muscle recruitment, um, and training specific muscles for the activity that we expect them to do. And then again, with recovery, um, we need time off. We need massage. We need rest. We need recovery foods. So um, that's a whole nother talk in and of itself. I do think that, again, as we age, giving our bones what they need, the vitamin D, the calcium, and magnesium to keep those bones strong and healthy is incredibly important. And then again, coming back to diet, that high-protein diet, or one of um, either leucine, creatine, or branched-chain amino acids to support your muscle recovery and muscle recruitment. So what about the antioxidants? You know, should we all be taking vitamin A, uh, you know, carotenoids, um, vitamin C, um, melatonin? And I think really, again, they may have some improvement in decreasing the degenerative processes in the body, but the purity of what is available over the counter and the benefits for decreasing illnesses is still somewhat unknown. A low calorie diet, again, we talked about how this activates that CERT1 gene and leads to better fitness age. I think it's really important. Follow a low calorie diet. Look at what your basal metabolic rate is and eat accordingly. What about creatine? Well, I mentioned in the last slide using one of those proteins, whether it's creatine, leucine, or branch chain amino acid, I think there's very good research to support that these are beneficial in minimizing muscle loss and may be helpful in improving muscle gains as we exercise. And then finally, calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium again for normal bone health. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I do um, own a company called Dr. Nye's OC2. And the reason that we developed this supplement was all of the above information we've been discussing. Um, again, it's a powder. It can be mixed readily with cold uh, liquids or semi-solids to give you a daily dose of calcium, magnesium, vitamin D3 and creatine monohydrate. Please check it out on boneandmuscle.com. These are my references. Um, these are also, um, several of these are listed on my website, um, but I would encourage all of you to read through uh, some of these articles uh, to really learn more about this very complicated medical topic.